Well, thank you very much indeed, Paul, for that very kind, somewhat embarrassing introduction. You can consider yourself invited permanently to all my parties going forward now. <laughs> but it is a terrific honor and delight to be here tonight. We spent the first half of the evening honoring Terry, and as chair of the Knight Badgett Foundation, I'd like to add my note of profound thanks to her for all the great work she's done as a lion of business journalism training. And now it's my chance to interrogate another lion of business journalism and journalism general, um, Marty Barron, who has been a great inspiration, a great sub source of fascination for many people in the room here tonight, not just because of the extraordinary career you've had at the Miami Herald, New York Times, LA Times, Boston Globe, and now Washington Post, but also, as Paul just said, because of the Spotlight film. And I noticed there wasn't a spontaneous round of applause when Spotlight was mentioned. Was that accurate, that film? I mean, you weren't portrayed as being particularly cuddly or friendly in that film, were you? Well, look, uh, throughout my career, people have said that I'm not warm and fuzzy. Uh, and uh, once some interviewer said that to me, and I said, well, that's not true. I am fuzzy. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do think, I, I do think the movie uh, is, uh, reflects how that investigation evolved. Uh, it's very faithful. They did a tremendous amount of research. Uh, it is a movie. It's not a documentary. Uh, this, the sequence of events has to be compressed into two hours, and uh, there is creative license. Uh, but uh, I think they did an incredible job of sticking very closely to the, the facts of that investigation. Do you think you've changed since those days? Has the move to Washington changed you? Me as a, as a person, as a journalist? As a leader? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think everybody learns from your experiences. Uh, I mean, as, as Paul mentioned in his very kind introduction, and uh, it's a little scary that he might remember my letter of application to the LA Times in 1979, uh, but... Um, <laughs> It's all about that deep research. It's, it's, it is terrifying. But the, um, I mean, you learn in every one of these things. I mean, I, as, as Paul mentioned, I've dropped into a, a bunch of different newsrooms. Some have said that I'm transient. But uh, I, I've, I've moved around, and I've been an editor now of three uh, news organizations. And uh, you learn each time. And I've learned as an editor. I mean, I became an editor. Uh, when I became business editor of the, of the Los Angeles Times, I was 29. Uh, and I didn't really know very much. Uh, and I made a lot of mistakes, and I've made mistakes throughout my career. Uh, but you, learn from, I, you should learn from each one of those. Uh, so I think I, um, I'm different in, the, in that way, and just sort of a little bit, not wise, but wiser. Right. Well, you've been in the Washington Post now since 2013. Um, and you've been in the hot seat now for all of 10 months since the arrival of a certain Donald Trump. Yeah. What have you learned in the first year of the Trump's presidency about what you need to do to run a major newspaper? Uh, look, I, what, what we need to do is what we've always done. Uh, I don't really think it changes our mission whatsoever. I think it, we have to make sure that we're rededicate, we rededicate ourselves to our mission, uh, that we stick to our mission, and that we don't get distracted by all of the attacks. I mean, pretty much every day or every other day, he's calling us fake news or some other name, and he did that throughout the campaign, you know, call, calling us, uh, you know, disgusting, garbage, scum, uh, the lowest form of uh, humanity, and then that obviously wasn't enough, so he said the lowest form of life itself. Um, <laughs> or down there with the uh, and amoeba. Then, and then, yeah. we became, yeah, then we became enemy of the people, and, and uh, he's still struggling to find something worse than that, I think. Uh, but I'm sure he'll come up with it. Uh, but, you know, I think it's important that we not just get distracted by that. Um, I mean, it's important. I think it has a corrosive effect on American democracy. Uh, it has a corrosive impact on, on, our, on our business in, in some ways. Um, over the long run, and I think that that should be very concerning. Uh, but we have to stick to what we do. Uh, and I remember after, after the election and people were sort of wondering, okay, well, what, how, how, what do we do? And the answer is we do what we've always done, uh, the way we would cover any administration. And we cover it aggressively, energetically, and keep in mind what uh, the reason there's the First Amendment in the Constitution, and that is to hold uh, government accountable. But when journalists are under attack, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis in that way, 
do you not worry that your own journalists will you know, automatically start to feel defensive and become biased? Because that's essentially the criticism of much of the Trump group right now, that journalists are fundamentally biased. They cannot be trusted to do their job. Yeah, well, that's what they say. I mean, I don't, I don't buy it. I mean, I think that, look, I mean, if, if, uh, if doctors can treat people who uh, they don't particularly like, and if, and if lawyers can represent people they don't particularly like, I certainly think we can cover the Trump administration. So, and it's not a matter of liking or, or, not, or not liking. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like what they say, but it doesn't mean that we aren't going to do our jobs in a proper and professional way, and, and we are. And but do you think any part of his criticism is fair or valid? Because, you know, the fact is that trust in the media has fallen very sharply. It has. It has. I mean, uh, and it's, it, predated, it predated Trump. So uh, trust in the media has been declining over a long period of time. Uh, trust in actually, I mean, you need to put that in context, the trust in pretty much all major American institutions has been declining. Uh, I mean, it's not saying much, we're ahead of Congress. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, if you actually look at uh, trust in the presidency, that's declined very sharply over the last year, to the point where now trust in the press and trust in the presidency are about to intersect. So in that strange way, Trump Down has brought there. us closer together. Uh, and, and I, and I think that, um, and so you look, I mean, if you look at major American institutions, whether it's big business or whether it's the medical institutions or organized religion or run down the list, you've, all, you've seen a decline in all of them. Uh, the only ones that have, maintain, that have maintained their levels of trust are the military uh, and the police. And the police are beginning to wobble a bit, uh, but the military has held on to it. So yes, it is concerning, but you know, what can I do about that? I mean, I, I think we need to keep in mind the long run. If you look back to the Nixon administration and, and the Watergate investigation, the press was viewed uh, very, very negatively throughout that. It was viewed as a partisan effort on the part of the media. Uh, many of us uh, can remember the vice president at the time, Spiro Agnew, his first vice president before he had to resign in scandal, uh, was the designated attack dog against the media. Uh, you know, he had all those alliterative phrases, nattering nabobs of negativism and uh, hopeless, helpless, uh, hypochondriacs of history and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't elegant prose. You can't tweet that. But the point was, the point was made. And, um, and so and the, the ratings for the press were extremely low at that time. And then it turned out that the reporting was validated. Uh, and the ratings for the press rose sharply uh, after Nixon resigned. Uh, because the reporting was validated. And they probably got to the highest level we'll ever get. They're about the mid-50s, and we'll ne probably never get higher than that because somebody's always upset with us about something. Uh, so I take the long view, and that is, you know, will the reporting be validated over the long run? I believe our reporting will be validated over the long run. In fact, most of it's been validated in the short run. And a lot of the things that the president calls fake news are... Um, already proven to, to be true. You know, we wrote about uh, General Flynn, who was the first uh, national security advisor. He was in office, I think, for a total of 20 days, something like that. Uh, we wrote about how he had, contrary to statements he had made, uh, that he had been communicating with the, uh, with the Russians and had been discussing the potential lifting of sanctions. And um, it's because of that disclosure, uh, not because the president had just learned it, because he knew it, uh, but because of that disclosure, the General Flynn was forced out of office by the president dismissed him, saying that he had lied to the vice president. More seriously than that, he had lied to the American public. And, um, and so that uh, later, subsequent to that, you know, we, we said in that story that we had nine sources, and we did have nine sources. But subsequent to that, the president gave a speech in which he said, you know, they, these, these places say they have nine sources. They don't have any sources. Uh, if you see anonymous sources, uh, that means they have no sources. And he was talking about our story, except the problem was that, that he had just dismissed the National Security Advisor on the basis of uh, the facts that we had just disclosed. And, uh, and right now, you know, they've talked about launching uh, more leak investigations than even the Obama administration had, had uh, initiated, which was a record uh, as well. And, um, you know, in order to, um, in order to launch us, a successful leak investigation, there both has to be a source and the information leaked has to be true. So if these things were made up, why are there leak investigations? It's completely head spinning. So uh, the very fact that there are leak investigations tells you 
that what we reported was in fact true. So how often do you have to deal with the White House? I mean, have you had Trump calling, your president calling you up at uh, odd hours of, or day and night? Do they call you up each day? Well, he doesn't call me up day and night, uh, you know. So, how often does he call you? Uh, not that often. It's happened, it's happened a couple of times, so. And what, does, what motivates him to call you? What are the things uh, that really? Uh, uh, stories he doesn't like, so. <laughs> what else? He wouldn't call me to say hello and have a cheerful conversation, <laughs> you know. Do you think you've made any mistakes in dealing with the White House or the new president in the first year? In, in, in how we've dealt with the White House? Yes. I don't mean mistakes of story because you correct those. Yeah, right? I mean, we, you know, like everybody else, we're, hu we're human. And so, you know, errors are made and, and we seek to correct them. But the, uh, I don't, I don't uh, you know, honestly, nothing really comes to mind. I think that we've done quite a good job. Uh, I think people have maintained their composure and uh, despite these attacks, uh, I'm proud of people for having done that. I'm proud that we continue to be energetic and aggressive in our, in our reporting and that we're not intimidated. I mean, the whole purpose of these attacks is, is uh, first of all, to destroy our credibility with the American public and that has a purpose so that he alone, to use his own phrase, he alone uh, will be the source of information for the American public, uh, but it's also to intimidate us and uh, we are not easily intimidated. We shouldn't be easily intimidated. We should just come in every day uh, trying to do our, our work. Every day that I walk into our newsroom, every, every day that I walk into our newsroom, we have the principles of the Washington Post that have been there uh, for eight decades, more than eight decades. And the first one is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. Uh, and that tells you that the truth can be elusive, it's hard to find, uh, but it also, t and that we are supposed to be in the process of striving. But it also tells you that there is a truth. It's not just a matter of opinion, and it's not a matter of alternative facts. Uh, there actually are facts, there is a truth, uh, and our job is to continue to search for it. So, are you watching his Twitter feed? Are you watching your phone, cell phone, round the clock? I mean, when do I don't, you ever get? I, I don't. When do you ever get a break? I, I don't. Uh, fortunately, we have people who do that. Uh, so uh, you know, the staff. <laughs> do you follow do him? Have, on, do you follow him on Twitter? I don't know. Uh, so, uh, but if he says anything consequential, I find out about it because we report it. And Does he follow you? I doubt it. Uh, I don't think so. And I don't, I, I'm tweeting less and less these days, so there isn't much to follow. So I've discovered it's safer to tweet uh, less frequently. So, right. um, so um, but I don't follow him. No, I, I decided not to. I mean, the other key figure in your life in the last year or two, of course, has been Jeff Bezos, who is somebody who the president also likes to attack. Um, particularly aggressively recently. Yeah. Um, now, when you first became editor of The Post, Jeff Bezos had not yet bought you, right. but you obviously stayed on. Well, what it kept me on. <laughs> what is it like working with Bezos? Does he get involved in discussing where the paper's going and discussing Absolutely. what kind of political direction you should be taking in your coverage? Not in the coverage. Uh, in the, uh, he does get involved in, heavily involved in the tactics and strategies uh, of the post. Uh, how we can be more digital, how, what we can do in terms of technology, how we might apply metrics to our business, uh, how we can think, um, uh, how we can uh, build our subscription model. Um, look, I mean, he came in, he, he has not only financial capital, but he brought intellectual capital, and the intellectual capital is at least as valuable as the financial capital. Uh, I mean, the financial capital is important. We needed that to help us make a transition uh, to a digital era to be able to experiment and try a lot of different things without being in the middle of cutbacks and things like that. I think that was very important to us. Uh, but also, he's brought ideas, and uh, they've been important. And uh, I think that that has, that has helped. We talk to him about once every two weeks on a, on a conference call. Uh, occasionally he's in Washington and comes by to visit us. Sometimes he's in Washington for other purposes and he doesn't come by to visit us. As for the coverage, he doesn't get involved in it uh, at all. He doesn't tell us which stories to do. He doesn't tell us which stories not to do. He doesn't comment on any stories, including any story about Amazon or any of his other ventures. Uh, he just doesn't. And, um, you know, it, it, I guess it serves the president's interest to try to suggest that he does. Um, 
you know, maybe, you know, maybe Trump would if he were the owner of the Washington Post. I suspect he would. Um, I don't think he would maintain kind of a hands-off policy toward our coverage. Uh, but, um, but Jeff has done that. He's given us our, our complete independence, and I very much appreciate that. So would you investigate Amazon if yeah, a story, sure. a tip came that way? Yeah, sure. And we've had have stories. You, have you? Uh, no, we haven't really found, you know, something to investigate as such. Uh, we have written, we've had uh, negative stories. Uh, we had a column just, just yesterday, as a matter, or it was today, I can't even remember, uh, today, I guess, uh, about this uh, new product called Amazon Key, uh, where you can allow the div delivery person to actually come inside your house and leave the package there, because there's a little camera. Uh, the columnist hated, hated, uh, hated the, the idea of it. Uh, but um, we, had a, we had a piece in the business section that talked about uh, Amazon as a potential emerging uh, monopoly and whether the antitrust laws should be uh, reconsidered uh, in light of how these companies become so big, not just Amazon, but obviously the other right. major tech companies. And uh, I haven't heard one word from him about, about any of right. that. So not one word. So what are the key ideas that Bezos has given you about how to develop the post. I mean, what's been the top idea, if you like? Well, the first I think many people today are searching. For yeah. A well, this model doesn't apply to everybody. Uh, you know, I mean, and, and maybe everybody has to come up with their own model, I guess. So, look, I mean, the first and most fundamental thing that he he talked about was changing our strategy. Uh, we at that time were a, a regional news organization, uh, sort of focused on D.C., Maryland, Virginia, uh, and then, of course, recognizing that that encompassed the nation's capital, and so we'd cover politics and policy, all of that. Uh, but he immediately came in and he said that he didn't, did not think that the regional model was going to work and that we needed to be a national and even international news organization. That we had, here we were, an industry and a, and a business that had suffered all of the, all of the terrible things that the internet could, could do to us. You know, it had taken so much away from us. Uh, and yet the internet offered, uh, as he called it, gifts. Uh, the primary gift, was free distribution, that we were able to distribute our product anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world at, at, at virtually zero marginal cost. And why would we suffer all the terrible things that the internet was doing to us and not take advantage of the things that the internet had to offer us? And we were able to do that because uh, we were in the nation's capital, so that helped to be a, a national news organization. We had the name, the Washington Post. It's very hard to be national unless you're, um, you know, the New York Times has done it, uh, can do it. Uh, but other than that, there aren't very many uh, that can do it. All of the newspapers that I've worked for in, in the past, be very difficult to turn those into national, into national products. And on top of that, we had a history and identity that had been shaped by Watergate, uh, a history of, of Watergate that had shaped our identity. Uh, and that sort of, we didn't have to go searching for an identity for our organization. We were an, an organization that sought to shed light in, in dark corners, uh, to, uh, to, hold the government, to hold the government accountable, uh, to hold our politicians and our policymakers accountable. And uh, that is our identity. That was our identity at the time after water, and as part of the Watergate investigation, and that is our identity today. So you want to be a national media group that's really using digital strategies in particular. Um, I mean, you did also get a lot of cash, which helps in today's world. Well, and you've hired. I mean, how I don't much? Know what how you mean much by, I don't know what you well, mean by get investment, cash, but investment, we got invested investment. cash. How much investment have you had? Um, well, I wouldn't tell you, but the... Um, <laughs> well, you believe in... You it's believe a real good question for you believe a in transparency ask, but I don't plan to answer You believe it. in transparency and openness. I mean, because, you know, one of the ironies is that we don't actually know a lot about how the Washington Post is actually operating today. Right. I mean, you, yeah. we, you've that's hired... A good, that's good. I'm glad. <laughs> well, somebody like Trump would say that's not so good. Um, but well, he's not here, so um, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. So, so you've got about. So you've hired about 150 people in the last in the four newsroom, years. Yeah. In the newsroom, in the last four years. Yeah, and we've hired in our engineering department too. One of the big areas of investment has been in our in technology. We very much believe that we have to be at the forefront of technology, uh, and uh, and we have become, got gotten to the forefront, and we're actually now a vendor of technology to other. So, how many digital subscribers do you have? Well, earlier this year, we passed a million digital-only subscribers, and that's on top of the people who get a print edition and then get digital access with that print edition. Right. And how much do you expect to have on current trajectory in the next couple of years? 
Well, I don't know. We don't have, I, I'm not aware of a projection that we have, but I was asked recently, well, okay, you've, you've gotten a million. What comes after that? I said two million. So, um, <laughs> and I would hope that we would get there. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but we, we're more than a million now, uh, considerably more than a million, and we expect to continue to grow. We, we've been growing every month. And are you profitable? We are profitable. We, last year, uh, I can tell you that. Uh, so um, we were, last year was the first profitable year we had in many years uh, for the post, uh, which explains why we were sold in the first place. Um, and uh, this year we're having a very good year, uh, a very good year. So, so and the reason for that is because, and the reason for that are all these subscriptions. Uh, that is, that is, has been absolutely critical to us. It's central to our business model is to, get more and more subscribers. Uh, we believe, uh, I mean, Jeff was quoted in an interview not too long ago uh, where he was asked his basic principles and he said, be riveting, be right, and ask people to pay, they will. And that's what we do is we try to be riveting, try to be right, and we do ask people to pay. Uh, we have a very tight paywall uh, and we believe that if people uh, want to read our work and we believe they should read our work, that they also need to pay. And the truth is, is that if, you, if people don't start to pay for quality journalism, they will not get quality journalism. Right, well, certainly. I mean, somebody from the FT should know that, right? Well, from the FT, we thoroughly applaud that sentiment. So thank yeah, you exactly. for helping us. You got us. there before we did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> helping, uh, thank you for helping us all in that respect. But um, how much of your revenue does um, subscription now represent? Uh, I wouldn't tell you that. Uh, and I don't know that number off the top of my head anyway. So, but you don't I, know that number? We're called a private company. You've heard of those, right? So, I have heard of those. Uh, but I, I've also heard about your mantra of transparency and disclosure. 100% owned by Jeff Bezos. So um, if he wants to tell you, he can tell you. But it's not my place to tell you. OK, well, I'll ask him then at some point. But I'm curious. So you've invested, you've, you've hired 150 people, which, by the way, on behalf of all the journalists in the room, I think we can all agree to celebrate because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these days <laughs> there aren't that many other major organizations that are hiring frantically. Um, the one area, though, that looking through the, journal, uh, through, through the post these days, which is striking, is your business section, since we are talking with business journalists here, has not been an area, it seems, of major investment focus. Right, yeah. Um, why? Yeah. Not yet. Yet. Yeah. So tell us, you now have a captive audience. Tell us how you plan to invest another 150 people, hire another 150 well, people. Well, I'm not saying journalism. we plan to put 150 people in the business section, uh, although our business editor would appreciate that, I think. But that's just not going to happen. So um, look, we just added, um, we've added uh, over time. Renee Merle is here. She works in New York for us. Um, uh, and prior to that, uh, to Renee wanting to come to New York. We didn't, we didn't have somebody here in New York. We had cut back on that. We now have uh, Liz Dwaskin in Silicon Valley, uh, is a terrific reporter. Uh, we just hired Jeff Fowler from the, from the Wall Street Journal uh, to be a technology columnist for us. Uh, we do anticipate uh, increasing our coverage in technology, technology policy, places like that. Uh, I think that you know, we, we do anticipate increasing the size of our business uh, staff. Um, so, and in other areas too. So we are adding to our foreign staff. We did this year. Uh, we will next year as well. And, um, and we're adding, we added to our investigative staff. We doubled the size of our investigative unit. We added uh, eight people for something that we call a rapid response investigative team. Uh, and that's five reporters, an editor, uh, a graphics person, and a data person. And uh, that's, they've been hugely successful. They're not only investigating the administration, but they're partnering with every single department to increase the number of investigations that we have going at any one time. Right. Um, how is the current debate in Silicon Valley, in Google and Facebook, about subscriptions impacting the post? Because, you know, obviously for everyone in the publishing industry right now, the increasing dominance of Facebook and Google has been both an opportunity but also a major, major threat. Yeah. How do you, you know, what exactly are you going to do with them going forward on this subscription side if you think that your business is gonna be primarily about subscriptions. Right, well, by the way, it sounds like there's a really good party downstairs. Uh, so, 
if so, if you're getting bored, uh, maybe they want you to join. But, um, you know, Facebook and Google, uh, you know, look, they're, they're important partners of ours. We recognize that they, are, they fall into the category of frenemies, I guess. Uh, uh, but, but they're really important to us, and we have a very good relationship with them as well as Apple. And, um, and we intend to maintain a good relationship. But we, are, we do uh, want them to do more to help us uh, get subscriptions. Uh, we think that that's just absolutely necessary, not just for us as a news organization, but for the entire industry, as a matter of fact. And um, so Google, of course, has announced a change in its approach. It's, it's not insisting any longer on its first click free that any story that you see on Google search uh, or Google News that you're able to actually read. Uh, they are going to allow us to set a uh, pay threshold uh, to off wh whatever we would like it to be. And that's kind of what we like, that we're allowed to, to determine our own business model and set the, set the model at however many free uh, articles we would like that to be. And so uh, we're, I think, uh, encouraged by that. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but we're encouraged by that. Uh, Facebook's model is a little bit, uh, we would love them to do more. Uh, you know, so far they seem to want to maintain sort of this 10 free articles uh, per month. Uh, but if you actually think it through, uh, how many people are hitting 10 articles? If they're getting news on a social media feed, how many, how many people are getting to 10 articles for a single media per, uh, outlet? Uh, and then if you look at that and then you look at the percentage of people who once they hit a paywall, actually convert to subscribers, you're talking about very low numbers. And so I think that I, I think Facebook is going, going to have to do more. Right. Do you think that Facebook and Google are too powerful? I mean, do you think they should be subject to the same publishing no, I constraints as publishers? I wouldn't even pronounce on that because that's pronouncing on a public policy issue that we are likely to cover, and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to do that. Uh, that that's for other very, people. A very clever dodge there, but... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but do you want that to try was and give it a That's give exactly how I intended it. <laughs> so I'll ask the question again. Do you think that Facebook and Google should be subject to, to the same laws as you, as a publisher, are subject to? What laws are you talking about? Well, to do with um, essentially having responsibility for content. Not well, well, there's no law that covers us, and there's nothing that requires us to be responsible. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that we don't that certain elements of the media don't always meet that requirement. If there were such a requirement, so um, there are no laws like that. I mean, so it's. I mean, the question would be: Are they to be regulated simply because they have too much power generally, not just in terms of their impact on our industry, but on any industry, a lot of other industries out there as well? And on that, I don't. I don't intend to express an express an opinion. I mean, we, uh, look, I just said deal with them the way they are. Uh, my view is, you know, we're, this business, we're all in the reality business. Uh, it took us too long to face up to the reality of how our business had changed. Uh, so I think we should just face up to realities. And the reality is they're there. They're important. They're powerful. They're, uh, they're an intermediary. Um, we, uh, we need to work with them constructively. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, and we, feel, we think they feel we are a constructive partner, and we have good conversations with them about this. Uh, at the same time, you know, we don't want to be t entirely dependent on them, and that is why we're pushing for subscriptions, and that is why we find, we find some ways around them, too, by the way. So we've built up our newsletter business in a very substantial way. It's a great way to get, uh, to get readers, uh, regular readers. Uh, people love to just get, you know, did not actually make any effort to go find their news. And if a, news, an, a newsletter lands in their inbox, you know, there's a good chance they'll read it and at some point that they will actually subscribe. And those people are reading our stories without going through Facebook, without going through Google, without going through Apple News, without going through anything. Uh, they're just coming to us directly. And we want to cultivate that relationship. Right. Well, that's certainly been a very striking development. Um, I went around earlier and asked a number of people what they thought I should ask you. And you crowdsourced it, that's good. <laughs> yep, crowdsourcing. I should have done it on Twitter, actually, or I should have done it on social media. But um, one question that cropped up was Harvey Weinstein. Do you think that the scandals are going to change the culture in the media and Hollywood? I mean, were you surprised by what's happened? Uh, I don't know that I was entirely surprised. I mean, I give total credit to the New York Times and the New Yorker for those stories. That's really fantastic work, and I... Um, you know, I, nothing, 
you know, nothing but praise. So, I mean, that was just very good, excellent work and obviously is having a, a tremendous impact. So uh, that's great. Um, I think that, um, you know, I mean, I don't, I think there's certain elements of the media where it's obviously this has been a, um, um, uh, has been a, a characteristic of certain elements of the media and to the extent that I'm not aware of it and within our profession, to tell you the truth, I, I'm just not aware of it. But, but I'm sure that plenty of people are. Uh, so, um, you know, we should do everything we can to make sure that we have a, 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 a healthy workplace, uh, that we uh, treat everybody with respect. Uh, and, that's tr and that should be true of every industry out there. And uh, I mean, I'm not surprised that it was happening in the inter entertainment industry, to tell you the truth. So, uh, because they've made movies about this subject, uh, about studio heads, powerful studio heads preying upon actresses and things like that. So it doesn't exactly surprise me that it would be happening because they made movies out of their own an experience they obviously were observing. Uh, but the great achievement here was the ability to document it. It's not always so easy to document this, uh, and, but it's, I think it's, it's important that it's, it's been done and uh, it's obviously having an impact. Right. Well, we're sadly almost out of time, but I just got a couple more questions. Um, firstly, I'd like to ask the question I was taught to always ask when I was at journalism school many years ago, which is, is there anything I've not asked you that you think I should have done? No, I think you've asked about just about everything you could ask. Oh, uh, no, actually. there's plenty more I could I ask. I imagine anything else that you might want to ask. So my question then is, if someone is going to make the sequel to Spotlight, what is that going to be? I don't know, Harvey Weinstein, I guess, but it's not going to be, I'm not going to be part of that one. So um, I, don't, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I have no idea. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, there'll be, there's a, you know, there's a good movie coming out about the Pentagon Papers in December. Um, uh, I guess, I think it'll be a good movie. Uh, there are, you know, there will be, look, there's going to be great investigative journalism. There should be great investigative journalism. And if that leads to a movie, fantastic. I never expected this movie to be made. Uh, this, these stories uh, first broke, we broke our stories at the Boston Globe at the beginning of, uh, in January 6, 2002. And, uh, it was many years before we were ever approached about having this movie made, and then it took, I think, eight years uh, or seven years by the time the movie actually was, was made. Uh, it doesn't have any of the qualities that you would expect in a, in, in a movie these days. No superheroes, no special effects, and certainly no romance. Uh, so, um, <laughs> um, and so I, I, uh, I never expected the movie to be made, and it, you know, it turned up on the blacklist of the, Hollywood has this thing called the blacklist, which is the 100 best uh, unproduced scripts. It's really depressing when you see there, wow, there are 100 really good unproduced scripts. And to me, that was like the blacklist equals black hole. And I never thought this thing would be made. But all of a sudden, it, it was. Things turned around. And I'm told that the financing for the movie fell apart three times, including during filming, uh, that it looked like it might halt. And um, But fortunately, it was made. And I think what's uh, what I'm gratified about is that it draws attention to investigative reporting, uh, to the need for it, to holding, our, to holding powerful individuals and institutions accountable, uh, that it's caused some uh, news organizations to rededicate themselves to that, uh, and the owners, the publishers, the editors to rededicate themselves to that. I think it's important that it's caused the, the public to appreciate what it takes to do it and do it right. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that's been, um, right. that's been hugely beneficial uh, for I our mean, industry. Since we are right now dealing with so many young student early career journalists and the whole aim of the Light Budget program is to try and raise standards in the business journalism, financial journalism world. Um, and speaking as someone who was a former business journalist and business editor, do you have any sort of words of advice for um, the kids in the room? Um, do you have any, any things that you wish you'd known when you were starting your career? Um, Other than you look, might I mean, end up in Hollywood? Yeah, right, I never, that's, that I never imagined. But the, um, I think that, um, I mean, I think it's important to just be always be optimistic. That's what I think. I mean, I don't know, I realize that we, the profession faces all sorts of challenges, the industry faces all sorts of challenges, it's so easy. Uh, to be discouraged by that. 
Uh, but I think it's really important to be optimistic. First of all, I don't think we have any other choice, frankly. I mean, how, does, how, do, how do you go into work every day thinking that you're going to fail? Uh, how is that possible? I don't know anybody who's ever succeeded who went into work every day thinking they were going to fail. I mean, that's just not, that's, somehow that's not going to work. Uh, and, and I think that there are signs of, that are encouraging. I think, for example, now subscription model is really encouraging. I think there's also been a big shift in the public's uh, thinking about uh, about the press. I think that a huge segment of the American public, not all, but a huge segment of the American public, which gets lost in all this polling about confidence in the media, trust in the media, is that many people now have a better appreciation for the role of the press in, an American in, an, in the American democracy. Uh, they took us for granted before. They don't take us for granted today. And that's why they've begun to support us. Uh, so. So I think, I, look, the, I, I think that we have an opportunity right now to reinvent journalism. I think it's being reinvented. It's exciting to be a part of that. It's exhausting to be a part of that, but it's also exhilarating at the same time. And that is, uh, we're reinventing how journalism is, is conducted and how it's delivered and how it's, uh, and how it's framed. Uh, and we can still be absolutely true to our, uh, to our principles, to our values, and yet, uh, Ad adapt to a new digital age, uh, and not just adapt to it, but we have to actually really embrace that digital age. And I think that that's, uh, and so I think we should be optimistic, uh, because there are going to be, we're reaching more people than we ever did before. Uh, we can be more creative, we have more storytelling tools than ever before. And uh, given all that we've done, we're, I mean, we have all sorts of problems, but we're an amazing survivor. Uh, right. It's incredible. I mean, still today, in every community in this country, the newspaper, what was a newspaper, uh, is, or a news organization, is absolutely at the center of the community conversation and dialogue. And uh, that means that there's an underlying demand for the kind of work we do, uh, and we should never forget that. And on top of that, there's an, uh, th we're absolutely needed. This mission of holding powerful institutions and powerful individuals accountable, uh, if we don't do it, nobody else will. Well, here is to Marty Barron, newspaper editor and fuzzy optimist. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Marty and Jillian. Thank you to all the chairs. Thank you for all of you that came tonight to support us. And you're welcome now to join the reception with dessert that's in the foyer. Thanks for coming.